welcome everyone. I know you guys must be tired at this point of the conference. I'll be as pleasant as I can. Uh, my name is Antonio. I'm a, as Yodun has already said, uh, a senior software engineer with Red Hat. I work for the containers and container security there, where I lead the Cryo project, as well as uh, maintaining Docker, the Docker packages. Um, and also, I'm a Docker core, core maintainer upstream as well. Today, I'm going to talk about a brand new container runtime for Kubernetes, which is called Cryo, or CRIO, or whatever you want to call it, uh, which is the result of a fundamental change in the way Kubernetes used to interact with container runtimes like Docker and Rocket. We're going through a little bit of history as to why Kubernetes needed such a change, what were the issues that led to such a change, and now, I guess, we've built probably the most compatible runtime for Kubernetes out today. At least that's what I hope. Um, so what were the issues Kubernetes was facing at the time when it came to uh, interacting with a container runtime? Uh, two years ago or so, there were just Docker and Rocket as the container runtime. And you can see that guy in the picture is the Kubernetes maintainer or contributor, which is actually trying to uh, add a new functionality uh, to the API between Kubernetes and the container runtime itself. So it was really difficult, as you can see, because the interaction was built into the kubelet, uh, the kubelet source code itself. On top of that, uh, historically, uh, every time uh, someone upgraded Docker in a Kubernetes cluster, uh, everything was on fire. But that's actually understandable. I'm not blaming Docker for that, because Docker wasn't meant for Kubernetes itself. Docker is the development tool we are all used to it. But it wasn't built and focused on Kubernetes. So again, that was understandable, still an issue. Uh, other than maintenance issues, there were another issue around the pod concept that Kubernetes has. For Kubernetes, a pod is a set of application containers which are uh, isolated and constrained. Uh, in Docker and in Rocket, this is achieved by Linux and Spaces and Cgroup, whether for other uh, runtimes, like virtual machine-based runtimes, uh, the isolation and constraints can be provided by a virtual machine itself. So you can see uh, it wasn't all the same for every container runtime out there. And so probably the main issue was pluggability. Uh, since Kubernetes is and was uh, extensible at the time, and that's the aim for Kubernetes itself, there was actually no way to plug a new container runtime uh, in Kubernetes, so you were stuck with Docker or Rocket, or if you really wanted to try a new container runtime, you would have gone and cloned the Kubernetes repo, uh, modified the code, and add that functionality. So that wasn't actually, let's say, good, and that's why almost two years ago, the Kubernetes maintainers, contributor, the community met together and decided that um, we needed something to move out the responsibility of talking to a container runtime out of the Kubernetes source code itself. The solution was really clever, I'd say, because uh, they introduced a new API. This API is called the CRI, which stands for the Container Runtime Interface. It's a plug and play API. That means that as long as the container runtime implements the server side of this new API, Kubernetes is able to talk to this new container runtime uh, and do what it needs to do. It's a protocol buffer. It's a set of protocol buffer or gRPC API. It's available since Kubernetes 1.5. At the time, it was released as an alpha feature. Right now, we are at Kubernetes 1.10, going for 1.11. And uh, the main interaction with a, with a container runtime in Kubernetes is done via the CRI, so it's stable now. It's a client-server architecture, and again, that means Kubernetes implements the client for this API, and the container runtime implements the server side. Usually, 
the container runtime is a uh, long-running process, like a daemon, uh, which is listening on a unit socket where Kubernetes connects to. So the CRI itself consists of two main pieces. The first one is the runtime service itself, the core, the way to run containers, and is in charge of um, the life cycles of both containers and pods, uh, which includes actions like uh, starting a pod, stopping it, removing it, listing all the pods and containers on a given node, as well as uh, being in charge of the interactions between the kubelet, the end, the end user, and the containers itself. These actions usually includes actions like uh, getting the logs from containers, executing into a container, attaching, detaching, and stuff like that. Uh, next to the runtime service, we have another service, uh, which is the image service, which, as the name suggests, is in charge of managing images, uh, like listing images on a node, getting the status of an image to grab information like uh, the tags for a given image, the size of an image, as well as pulling it, removing images, and probably most importantly, the image service is also responsible to report uh, file system information to the kubelet itself. Kubernetes has a, an image garbage collector where it goes and try to remove uh, images to free space, so all of that is actually achieved through the CRI with that image build system info, uh, action. This is a uh, high overview of the CRI in action. You can see on the left side there is the kubelet, which is the client, and via the CRI API, it calls into the gRPC server, which is the container runtime itself. These slides actually shows you that the CRI shim and the container runtime are different pieces. But usually this is achieved by just one, one, uh, one demo, like cryo itself. And on the right side, you can see all the containers and pods running. So this CRI API has been great new for us because at some point, uh, at Red Hat at least, uh, some of us decided that the current state of container runtimes in Kubernetes wasn't that production ready, let's say, because Docker kept breaking when, when it was upgraded, it wasn't stable, we got many bug reports uh, and whatnot. So we decided that we wanted something uh, stable something secure and something, above all, meant for Kubernetes. We wanted something, we, we thought Kubernetes deserved its own runtime. And that, when, that, was when, that was when we created actually Cryo, which stands for uh, Container Runtime Interface for the Open Containers Initiative. I'll talk about the OCI uh, part in a bit. Cryo is a Kubernetes runtime it aims at, if you will, replace Docker as a default container runtime. Uh, it's a Kubernetes incubator project. That means that we stand to every uh, rules and processes inside the Kubernetes organization. That's why the first point is cryo is open governance. There is no single business or company pushing us to implement something just for the sake of implementing that or selling that. So community decides first. It's open source. We're on GitHub, of course. You, everyone is free to come uh, and contribute. It's lean. It's probably, it takes half of the memory and CPU consumption as, uh, as opposed to Docker, so it's far, far uh, faster. Uh, it's stable because we make sure Cryo won't break Kubernetes, never. We run tons and tons of integration tests, end-to-end tests, performance tests before every release in order to make sure that Cryo remains stable with regard to Kubernetes. It's secure because Cryo is really a small project. It started as a small project, it still is a small, uh, as a small code base. It's secure because we are able to audit all the source code probably one day. It's secure also because we, uh, we make use of best practices when it comes to Linux uh, security in containers, especially like SecComp, Selenux, uh, namespaces. Uh, and above all, it's boring. That was what uh, was the most important thing for us. It's boring because 
Kubernetes just needs a way to run containers. It doesn't need anything like uh, building images. So we needed something uh, for Kubernetes just to focus, so, so that Kubernetes can focus on the orchestration part, and the container runtime just launches container and manage them. So it's boring also because we stick with something uh, which is the OCI, the Open Container Initiative. For those who don't know, the Open Container Initiative, it's a set of specifications for the container ecosystem. It has right now two main specifications, uh, and Cryo sticks to this. Uh, the first one is the runtime specification, which tells how you run a container, which way you run a container using a configuration, for instance. And the other specification, it's the image specification, which, which again, as the name suggests, takes care of standardizing images. And we also love Kubernetes. This is probably my, the best slide, uh, because we really make sure that everything in between Cryo and Kubernetes work just fine, so that Kubernetes can focus on what it needs to do without bothering about uh, the container runtime breaking. So to further clarify the, the scope of Cryo itself, Cryo is tied to the CRI. That means if the CRI interface uh, tell us to implement something, we do that and just that. And again, we won't never implement something unneeded. Cryo itself is shaped around Kubernetes, and you can think of this as Kubernetes, for instance, runs a lot of actions like listing all the containers and images on a given node. We know that, and we, we try to make that code path even faster so that Kubernetes can leverage uh, all of that. That's why it's shaped around Kubernetes. The only supported user of Cryo itself is Kubernetes itself, of course, and OpenShift, if you will. Um, you're not supposed to actually run it the way you run Docker. That's another project. That's another way of running containers. Cryo is just meant to be used uh, under Kubernetes and OpenShift. We will never add any features that combine stability and performance. And as I said before, we will never add any cryo build, cryo commit. We, do, we don't need cryo push. We don't need all of these actions. Um, the versioning is tied to Kubernetes itself. This may be my blowing, but if Kubernetes is at 1.10, cryo guess is 1.10 as well. So it's easy to see which version comes with with which Kubernetes. Like right now, instead, if Kubernetes is at 1.10, uh, the supported Docker version is probably 17.04 or something like that, which is misleading. The support of Cryo is also tied to Kubernetes itself, and that means that as long as a Kubernetes release is supported, uh, the Cryo release for that Kubernetes release is supported as well. We will backport patches, security fixes, bug fixes, as long as uh, that, uh, that version of Kubernetes is supported. So enough theory. Let's go a bit technical. This is a really high overview of how Cryo works today. From left to right, you can see the kubelet itself, which calls into Cryo itself uh, through the gRPC API. Cryo is split into two main pieces as the CRI itself. We have the image service, which leverage uh, lever libraries like containers image and container storage. On the right side, we have the runtime service, which is using uh, libraries like the container storage library, which I will talk in a bit. The CNI, which is the one in charge of setting up the network stack for a pod. The OCI generate library to create configurations for the OCI container runtimes. And on top, you can see uh, two examples pod. You can see the application containers, container A and container B, an infra container, which is holding, again, the namespaces and C group to provide isolation. And then you can see this small rectangular common, which is a, which is a, a container monitor. I, I'm going to talk further about it in a moment. So the first piece uh, of Cryo itself, it's the OCI runtime. 
since we stick uh, to the OCI runtime specification, that means we can use any uh, low-level runtime as long as it implements this OCI specification, the runtime specification. Right now, the default is run C, which is the one Docker is also using. But we, we work it with other companies and projects. And for instance, we support projects like uh, Clear Containers from Intel, the new Kata Containers. And since the OCI runtimes are the heart, the kernel of, of a container runtimes, of course, we make sure that everything is tested and everything is working fine. And as you can see, uh, as soon as Kata Containers were supported, we instantly added a CI for, for it to make sure we don't break it um, as we develop. The other piece is the container storage library. Uh, this library was extracted by Docker itself. Docker has the notion of the storage drivers, which are called the graph driver. So we took um, this piece from Docker and we created the library so that anyone can use it. And we're using it for managing layers on copyright file system. By default, we use overlay FS. And again, container storage res is responsible for setting up the root file system for a container. The other big library we're using, it's containers image. It's the very first library we, we created. And that's why uh, I said that where everything started, because when we started Cryo, we just had this um, library, and we were like super happy because we had a way at least to, to manage the image service so that we can focus on the runtime service and, and develop from there. It's battle tested because we embed this library into Docker in the rel distribution. That means this library undergoes many, many tests, both Docker test, Kubernetes test, QE test, QA test. Uh, this library implements the Docker registry API v2. That means that if you push, if you build an image in, with Docker, and you push it to a registry, containers image is going to pull it just fine. Because I've been told many times, so can I, can I use my images? Yes. Images are, are built with Docker or with build out or whatever, and containers image can pull it. To, uh, Cryo can pull it. The other piece, a library we use, it's called the OCI uh, Generate. It's a library extracted from a tool called OCI Runtime Tool, which is in charge of creating the configuration to run a container. And since it's, these are OCI configuration, every runtime can actually use this configuration. And that's why we can swap and mix container runtimes under Cryo. Uh, this other piece is the network stack for, for, for Cryo itself. We use CNI, which is the default on, also in Kubernetes itself. Uh, it stands for the Container Network Interface. Uh, and it's a pluggable, um, it's a plugin based uh, library. That means that you can create your own uh, plugin for your, your favorite network stack. You just drop the plugin and the configuration on a host, and then it's working just fine. We tested it with uh, the, the Flannel plugin for Kubernetes, the Wave plugin, OpenShift SDN, and it's working just fine. This is probably the, the heart of Cryo itself. Uh, it's common, which stands for Container Monitor. It's a really small C application that it started when we need to create a container. And as the name suggests, again, it monitors the container. It's responsible for reporting the exit code or reporting uh, whether uh, there was a, a out of memory condition because Kubernetes cares about these conditions. It's responsible for logging. When you do a kubectl logs command, uh, what happens is through the CRI, we receive this logs request and command actually streams the log back to the user. It's responsible for handling the TTUI so that you can do uh, actions like kubectl exec, and you can enter a container with a shell. Um, and most importantly, probably, it's responsible for the whole life cycle of a container. Common is the parent process for the container itself. And that means that 
you can completely shut down Cryo and Kubernetes, and your application will still be running. Uh, as opposed to there's other runtimes where if you restart those, uh, containers go down. It's not the case right now, but it was the case in the past. So common takes care, takes care of all of this. This is a, uh, the architecture of a pod when run with run C, leveraging uh, Linux technologies. You can see all the containers in the pod itself are running with run C. The infra container itself is running with run C. Um, and the infra container is responsible for holding the namespaces and C group to provide isolation and constraints for the pod itself. And on the top, you can see that every container is a container monitor. This is instead the architecture for a pod running with a, with a virtual machine based at runtime. When it's a virtual machine based at runtime, we still have common to monitor every container, but there is a shim in between uh, common and the virtual machine. So these are run in the virtual machine with run C, for instance, but everything is isolated and constrained by the virtual machine. All right. Now, the difficult part. I'll try and uh, show you some basic examples uh, and commands you guys are all used to uh, with Kubernetes so that you can see that uh, switching around time from Docker to Cryo is going to be exactly the same because everything is working just fine. Not in my demo, but I hope so. So, you see? So, I'm running a Kubernetes 1.10 cluster, you can see here. I'm not running Docker. And I will show you in a moment. Right now, there are no containers. Um, we have some containers already running. You can see here the kubeDNS responsible for the network and the dashboard, which I'm going to show you in a moment. So you guys are probably used to commands like this one. So uh, I just created an HTTP uh, pod. We can see it's running. Let's describe it as you would have done with Docker as well. Everything is running. You can see here uh, that it has a cryo prefix, and that means this is running through cryo. So let's see if it's working. Let's grab its IP, no, IPO. Nice. So this is working, and this is uh, probably the silliest example, uh, but you can see that everything is working just fine uh, if you use cryo. Let's try some other command, like getting the logs for the HTTPD. Seems like it's working. We can curl it. And you can see the logs are here. You can also, we can also try the streaming functionality in common and the CRI itself. So I'm streaming the logs and I'm here. What was that, 42? Okay. This is working. All right. You can see that logs are streamed just by. Uh, well, that's silly, I know. Um, so you can see everything is transparent to the Kubernetes users because it's just working fine. And as another example, I run the kubectl proxy command here, and we can see that the Kubernetes dashboard is also working using cryo. You can see some, uh, right, not public. You can see some pods running here, the DNS and the dashboard. We can go to the default namespace and see that our HTTPD pod is running just fine. So. Again, you, you can see everything is, is actually uh, is working in, an, in a very transparent way. You don't need to care 
um, if it's running cryo or docker from, from this point of view, but uh, if you are in a huge cluster where you need stability and performance, you may want to use cryo. So this went fine, right? All right, awesome. So how we make sure that cryo works just fine with Kubernetes? We run tons, tons of testing. The status right now is that we run all the Kubernetes upstream end-to-end -end test, as well as the OpenShift end-to-end -end test, which is a superset of the Kubernetes end-to-end -end test. We run probably more than 300 tests for every pull request. That sounds insane, I know. Uh, and along with that, we also run the CRI test, which is a set of benchmarks and validations uh, for every container runtime for Kube running through the CRI. So we also pass this. Uh, we have lots of integration tests, more than 100. We make sure that for every features, new features added to Cryo, there are integration tests so that we don't regress on features. And as I said before, we run, not on every pull request, uh, a lot of performance testing. We run performance tests just before the release when we are in alpha stage to make sure that uh, if we're not better, at least we have not regressed performance-wise. So again, we run tons and tons of testing. The status right now is that, of Cryo itself, is that the CRI at any time is fully implemented. Uh, right now we are going to, to uh, Kubernetes 1.11, and so the CRI, as of today, it's fully implemented. If something happens, in the coming days, we make sure that if there is a new action in the CRI to implement, we will implement it. Right now, we release it more or less five releases, starting for starting from uh, the 1.7, uh, which is for Kubernetes 1.7, but we called it 1.0 because it was our first release. And and again, right now we're working on the 1.11 uh, release. We got maintainers and contributors from many companies like Red Hat, of course, Intel, IBM, SUSE, Leaf, you name them, and many others. We have more than 80 contributors, and I'm proud of that. Uh, if you want to test Cryo, there are some way I'm gonna show you in a moment, but KubeADM and Minikube are the ones uh, that you can leverage and actually test Cryo itself. Uh, Cryo supports something called mixed workloads. Mer mixed workloads means that uh, in a Kubernetes cluster running with Cryo, you can choose which low-level runtime to use uh, for your workload. For instance, you have your Nginx uh, trusted uh, image, you run it with run C because it's using the OS kernel, so you trust that application, that's not breaking. On the other hand, you may have a customer image where you don't trust which code is running into that and so you can say to Kubernetes and Cryo to run that image in a virtual machine, for instance, which is, if you will, more secure. So we support this as well through a Kubernetes annotation for now, but we're aiming at pushing these features to the pod specification itself. Um, right now, we deployed Cryo in our OpenShift Online test cluster, and I will, I will tell you later, we, we aim at actually going production in the coming month. It's available in Fedora, Ubuntu, RHEL, Debian. Just use your favorite package manager, and it, and it will install it just fine. If you want to play with it, you can uh, set up a Kubernetes using Minikube, uh, bootstrapping all of this with KubeADM, uh, and just saying that you want to use the Cryo Container Runtime and the CNI network plugins. Another way to uh, test Cryo if you are a uh, Kubernetes contributor, or you like to hack on things. Uh, there is this script, ec local app cluster the sage. Uh, you can go there and just launch this command, and this will bring, bring up a Kubernetes local cluster, which is going to connect to your instance of Cryo. If you're using OpenShift, just go on a node and change uh, the add this tree. Uh, arguments to the kubelet arguments and just restart the OpenShift node and you will be using cryo transparently. So in case everything is on fire, usually you guys are probably used to uh, like 
opening on a node and doing a docker ps, docker exec, let's see what's going on, docker logs for cryo and probably any other CRI based runtime. There is a tool called CRI CTL, which stands for CRI control or something like that, where you can issue the very same actions as you're used to with Docker. You can do CRI CTL exec, CRI CTL logs, PS, and whatever. So there is a tool to actually debug what's going on uh, with Cryo and any other container runtime using the CRI. Uh, right now, it's a Kubernetes incubator project as well, but we're aiming at uh, moving the project into the Kubernetes core uh, in the following month, hopefully. So, none of this, none of Cryo, could have had been possible without some libraries and tools that we've built over the years and the community built. One example are the tools under the project Atomic Umbrella, which is a, an umbrella for project uh, using container technologies. And as I showed you before, we used libraries like container image, container storage, open source tools like uh, RenC itself. And we've built uh, many other new tools so that the whole container ecosystem can benefit from all of this really quickly. The first one is Scopio. Scopio is a command line tool where you don't need any daemon actually running, just a, a command line, where you can play with the container C image. You can pull images, you can push images, you don't need the Docker daemon running. Uh, Scopio born because at some point we were looking to uh, just read the labels of an image on a registry. What, well, uh, what was happening was that in order to read the labels for an image, you would uh, pull the image, Docker inspect the image, and read the labels. That was sort of insane for images like the rel image, which is more than one gigabyte in size. So, but there was a way to actually uh, query the registry and ask for the configuration for an image which includes the labels. So we created this tool at first just to do that. And then we, we keep we kept uh, adding new functionality, and right now, as I say, it can pull and push images. It's also, um, we are also adding new features like uh, image verification, image signatures. Uh, so you can use this, this tool in, in, in pipelines as well, in Jenkins. Imagine you have a staging environment, a staging registry, and you need to move a staging image into a production registry. Again, what you would do is to pull the image and push the image. With Scopio, with just this command line, you can actually uh, say, all right, sync the staging image on the production registry without going this way, just straight from registry to registry. Because again, Scopio and containers image implements the Docker v2 registry uh, specification. Not working. Okay. The other tool is Builda. Builda is leveraging libraries like container image and container storage and run C as well. And it's a new way to build container image. Uh, so you guys can tell me what's the way to build container image today. Docker build. It's Docker build, just Docker build. Uh, but again, it requires a full daemon to be running, and that comes with security questions, let's say. So we created a, just a, common, a straight command line tool where you can build images. Uh, it's different from the Docker build process because build that as a shell-like syntax. It's not, there's no Docker file or build a file or whatever you want to call it. So it just plain commands uh, that are run as part of the building uh, of an image. Uh, but because we know many of you are probably already using Docker files, build that today also supports building images from Docker file so that we don't break you. All right. Last, uh, there is this new tool called Podman. Podman aims at completely replacing Docker on your uh, machines. 
It's a new way for running containers, um, and it has a really known CLI, for instance. You guys are used to Docker run Ubuntu. You know what that does. Or Docker run Ubuntu bash and drop you in a shell. Podman does exactly have the same command line. So you can just alias Docker uh, to Podman, and you will continue to use the very same command line. But this time, running Podman, running on all those libraries and tool and open source tool tools that we've built uh, over the month. And there is no daemon running again. All of these tools don't have a huge uh, Docker daemon, well, not Docker daemon, daemon running. Um, Podman will also be integrated uh, with, with Cryo itself so that in addition to using CRI CTL to debug uh, what's going on on a Kubernetes cluster running with Cryo, uh, you, will, you can also use Podman. So to sum this up, we've been talking about the CRI, which is this new API which empowers everyone to build its own runtime uh, and just plug it into Kubernetes. We've been talking about Cryo, which is this new container runtime that as of today, you can just go in your kube cluster and just stop Docker, install Cryo, and everything's going to work just fine transparently. And then we've been talking also about all the libraries and tools in the whole containers ecosystem. So what's the roadmap for, for Cryo itself? We aim at reaching uh, the default container runtime in Kubernetes, which as of today, it's still Docker through the CRI. We want to get rid of Docker uh, in favor of Cryo itself so that there is a more stable container runtime for Kube. That has not happened as of today, but we keep pushing. Uh, what we're going to do also is keep in peace with upstream Kubernetes. So we, we track upstream version. We make sure that for every release there is a uh, respective Cryo release. Uh, Another thing we want to do is graduating out of incubator. There is a long ongoing discussion. We're still an incubator project, but we have a, let's say, a huge user base uh, in ownership. So it, it, maybe it's time to get out of the incubator itself. It's fully supported in OpenShift 3.9. If you are a 3.9 user, you can just swap Docker in favor of Cryo and just work. And, but it's not the default yet. We, we we may want to go uh, general availability with Cry itself in OpenShift 310, hopefully. Uh, and again, we want also to um, deploy Cryo as part of our uh, cloud offering, which is OpenShift Online. So if you guys are super excited by all of this, we have many ways, you have many ways to get in touch with us. Uh, we do have a blog on Medium uh, where we constantly add new uh, blog posts and tutorials and whatever. Uh, we have our, of course, GitHub page where you're free to come and contribute or even just say hi. And we have also uh, an ARC channel in Freenode, which is just Cryo. And again, come and say hi if you will. Uh, we also hang out in the Signode channel of the Kubernetes Slack. So we're always there in the Signode because Kubernetes, uh, Cryo itself is part of the Signode uh, special interest group. And if you're interested in all the other tools I've been talking before, like BuildDoss, Scopia, Podman, and Cryo itself, we either have a Cryo website or the Project Atomic umbrella website where you can learn more. And there will be lots and lots of articles about all things containers. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe three or four questions. Questions here? Okay, first question here. I have two questions. Uh, one uh, first is, you know how much faster Cryo is from Docker? And uh, yeah. if, if Cryo is not used to build images, what OpenShift do you use for it? OK. Thanks. So the, the first, uh, to reply to your first question, uh, we do have numbers which are going to, we're going to actually show this in upcoming blog posts if you follow Medium. But we also, we already shared something. 
Uh, in terms of performance gain, when you use cryo, I can say it's probably half the memory Docker uses. So if Docker used one gigabyte, we were just at 500 megabytes. So, so this is the first one. The second one, since cryo is not building images, in OpenShift for the build pipelines, we're still using Docker build, but we're aiming at replacing Docker build with build up, which is the, uh, the other tool I've shown you before. So that's, that's on the roadmap. More questions? Yeah. All the other presenters are asking questions. <coughs> Uh, I, I do have a huge cluster in my, my company with something like uh, 2,000 PODs to a bit more Did of you them. you pay me to install Sorry. Cryo? <laughs> That's, they, they are all, all of them, they are on bare metal and I am like facing some issues with, with Docker, but the Kubernetes version is 1.7. So we are thinking about upgrading them and then uh, turning something like using cryo or something like that. Do you recommend that even if I, I do have a lot of a lot of stuff in production or you think that's better to for me to wait a little more like okay that's stable and go on? Well cryo it's already stable. We're using it, we're still testing it in our cloud offering because that takes more time and at least for my team it's not uh, the primary primary goal for at least for now, but cryo is completely. We got we got reports from companies like Lyft, which is the Uber in, in the U.S. Yeah, uh, they are running cryo. They don't tell that they're running cryo, but they're running cryo in production. So many of their service is already running with cryo. Are already running with cryo. So I would recommend. I personally would recommend you to actually upgrade because one seven is where the CRI itself is still alpha release. So if you go at least 1.9, because there is no 1.8 at all, uh, if you go 1.9, then definitely you can use cryo and just, and just get going. And again, as, a, as the previous question, you will gain a lot in performance. And if you have any issues, we have the tracker, we have Bugzilla's, you can, you, can, you can bother us at any time you want. I'm a, I, I am an old school guy, so I like IRC, and I can go back okay. and free note. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, maybe it's more of like an open question of sorts. Like a lot of people do use Docker for local development, like they run their containers, like maybe as a dependency. Can you speak a little bit about that with Cryo, or if that I, makes I any sense? I couldn't hear what you said before. Sorry. Yeah, a lot of people like they use Docker in local development, like mm -hmm. Docker Compose, spin up the dependency. So maybe if you could talk a little bit more about the development experience using Cryo. Oh, okay. So. So cryo is not meant for developers, so first. That's why we've created tools like this one, this tree. So there is no Docker Compose in our project Atomic Umbrella yet. Maybe there will be one in the future. But right now, if you want to develop any of your uh, images and or application leveraging containers, you can definitely use this tree command. And I will show you, like Podman is the way you would, you would like Docker run something. So with Podman, do I have Podman? Okay. So everyone knows this one. I don't know which image I have. All right, this has been run with Docker. I mean. Everyone in their development uh, platform use this, like for your Python application, Go application, whatever. What if I tell you that you can do exactly the same with this, hopefully? Of course. Well, forget the error log, but uh, as you can see, everything is transparent with this regard as well. You can just, you can swap from your Docker development way into um, different tools that actually achieve exactly the same. And I would say it's more into the Unix philosophy of having many tools doing something just focused on 
what they need to do, like building images you just have uh, Builder. Um, and I can tell you more about this because like having a huge tool like Docker is also risky and there have been many, many reports of like breakage where like someone uh, changed the Docker build and then Docker pool uh, was broken. That was because the code path was in common. They were using exactly the same code path, so someone changed pool and broke build, or vice versa. Whether even if we're sharing the libraries uh, within all of this project, we are actually these are actually different tools with different CIs, making sure everything is always in line and working. So again, if you if you're looking for uh, tools to develop, like you're already used to with Docker, we offer, we provide this, for instance, these three tools. And for Docker Compose, I don't really have a, uh, an answer right now, but who knows, probably we'll come up with something. Question? Good. All right. So thanks, Antonio, for your presentation. Hope you guys have a good time.